Um, so um, that's that's all I really have to remind everybody is just watch those um, the stereochemistry on that. And I guess let me let me pull up the slide the um, quiz question uh, because there's one point I want to watch want everybody to watch out for. Um, which is the the epoxides can seem like they're just two carbons long based on the way they're drawn to show the stereochemistry. Um, don't forget to still find your longest continuous carbon chain. Look it up here. Um, I think on, it was D on number one in particular. It looks like it's only two carbons, but it's really four carbons. It's it's a because you've got an ethyl group attached, but because it's written as ET, it's easy to miss miss that that's part of the longest continuous carbon chain. Yeah, it's got the to go back and Easy enough to do, right? Especially when it's drawn that way. There's a reason we always draw the epoxides like that, just like we used to with alkenes, right? Because that lets you focus on that functional group. Yeah. But you just have to watch out and not miss that other aspect. Uh, because it is way easier to figure out stereochemistry when it's drawn like that. But this bottom here, so that's one, two carbons, three, four, five. So it's actually a pentol. It's a pentane is your parent molecule there. So how would you decide where to start counting from? Like from the the benzene or from the uh, which side would be carbon one? Yes. So if we put the benzene, if we put this as carbon one, then that, that would make more sense because that keeps your epoxide between two and three and right. your, your branch on carbon one. If you counted from the other way, it'd be one, two, your epoxide would be between three and four, and then your benzene ring is on carbon five. So that's all of those numbers are higher. So there's Basically, that's that is unequivocally the better carbon to call carbon one. Yeah. Um, and I ran out of time to do my research on MTBE and why it's so hazardous. Um, but so I'll look into that. But from from what I remember, it can go through an acidic cleavage, but that's not the end, the end of the world um, because T-butyl alcohol and, um, and the, it's a methyl group on the other side. Methanol is not that dangerous and T-butyl alcohol is not that dangerous on their own. So regardless of which way it cleaves, it's not going to necessarily be um, the cleavage product that's the problem. I think it, it's just that the ether itself is a biotoxin on some level. I don't know if it's because it affects, you know, algae or the local ecology, or if it specifically is carcinogenic to humans. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's carcinogenic to humans. Um, but my, I think more than anything, it's how, so it's, it's not natural. It can dissolve small amounts in water, which means you find it in groundwater pretty easily. And if it's a carcinogen to humans or if it's dangerous to the local ecology, it's more the fact that it's in everything right now because it's in all gasoline. And so all gasoline having MTBE means that you're always, any small gas spill adds some of it to the water table um, and makes it so that that's gonna, gonna be really hard to get rid of and cause some repercussions down the line. Um, and in your biology classes or ecology classes, have you talked about I'm going to butcher the name. I think it's biomagnification. Oh, accumulation. Um, bioaccumulation. Thank you. Yeah, the way that more steps up the food chain you get, the more dangerous it gets. Like, so the, the classic example was DDT um, because they thought, oh, DDT is a great pesticide, kills all these bugs, doesn't seem to have, it's not that dangerous to humans. It's not good, but it's not that dangerous. Um, and all the local wildlife tolerates it at the level that you are using it except that every step up the food chain you go that increases the concentration by about a factor of 10. And so it wasn't actually just the, the higher levels of the food chain weren't getting it just at the same levels that the, 
the insects were, they were accumulating at much, much higher levels, which is why it's, all, it's always the big predatory fishes that have the mercury problem. And it's always, and it was the bald eagles that DDT caused problems for, right? Top of the food chain. Um, because, it, you know, the, the bugs get poisoned by it a little bit, but then the bugs get eaten by the small birds and the small, or the fish, and then the fish and the small birds get eaten by the eagles. And now you've amplified it a hundred times from what it was. And that's the same with the mercury. Small fish aren't a problem with mercury accumulation. But because there's these two giant tuna that have been living in the ocean, there's swordfish and sharks that eat hundreds of thousands of fish in their lifetime, they wind up with the ones that, where it's actually an issue. And so my guess is that MTB, without doing having done the research, my guess is it's an eco, it's an ecology issue and the fact that it's everywhere because gas is everywhere still. Um, and then... Uh, good question, Nikki, on the, how do you know what's the best, if you have two options for a Williamson ether synthesis, how do you know which is the better choice? Generally speaking, you want the, your halogen, um, to be as unsubstituted as possible because that's the target for an SN2 reaction, right? And so if you have a choice between, um, what's going to be your target and what's going to be your nucleophile, making the target a methyl group, if possible, or a primary carbon um, is better option, is more important than making the nucleophile primary or a methyl group. Um, if they're both secondary, then it doesn't really matter. They're going to be about the same speed, regardless of which way you go. Sometimes there's some fine tuning, like, oh, this one's a slight, it's, they're both secondary, but this one's got a bigger secondary groups attached to it. Um, make that one the, the nucleophile rather than the target, you always just want to minimize the sterics on the target, on the halogen, as much as possible. Did everybody watch the video from Thursday? Um, I hope that was okay that we didn't do a full lecture um, recording since everybody had stuff going on. Um, and this is kind of a weird reaction to get to wrap your head around, right? Um, and, and without even getting too much into the, what the structure of the DET is, it was kind of a sort of a guess and check. They knew that this type of molecule could act like a catalyst. And so Sharpless, um, specifically just found a version of that catalyst that was itself chiral with the, with the idea that if it's, if the catalyst is chiral, then that's going to favor specific enantiomers in the products as well. There's, and that's what the plus and the minus are. In biology, especially and in biochemistry, plus and minus refers to what which direction it rotates light. Because remember when we talked about um, enantiomers and we said, okay, you know, one enantiomer will rotate light clockwise and the other one will rotate at the same amount counterclockwise. Um, plus means that it rotates like clockwise. So, or what we would call uh, dexter rotatory. So it, it's not quite the same as saying R versus S because R means that the substituents are arranged in a right-handed pattern. Um, and rotating the light is not necessarily the, the same as counting your substituents. So the, there's a differentiation between how does it rotate light and how do we assign priority? Because assigning priority is somewhat arbitrary. Um, so, but plus or D um, represents that we're, that it rotates light clockwise and minus or L represents that it rotates light counterclockwise. Um, that made me triggered some memory talking to Bruce about right-hand rule. But not relevant, and I can't quite remember what it was anyway. So moving on. Um, and so the, the, way, the way to make sure that you get the correct stereochemistry on your products for these is, is some, again, somewhat 
guess and check, they found this method and sort of developed it. it you don't have to follow this method, but this is the method that's going to be most consistent um, and that's presented as the standard way to think about this. So you set up, and what you're going to do is for this Sharpless reaction, um, you're going to make an epoxide out of an alkene. So you always set up your alkene so it's into the board and out of the board. And you arrange it so that that OH, this reaction also doesn't happen without that OH there. It has to be an OH, an alcohol, in the allylic position for this reaction to happen. So that gives you two landmarks, right? You've got the alkene bond that you're going to set up going into the board and out of the board. The second landmark is the hydroxide group, is the alcohol, has to go to the back right. And if we if you set it up that way, then we use the plus DET as your catalyst, your epoxide is up. And we use the minus form of the epoxide, the epoxide forms down or below the plane. You can also think about this as instead of into the board and out of the board, it works just as well if you picture this being flat and just put the, al the uh, alcohol in the top right. And then the plus the ET would be out of the board towards us and minus the ET would be into the board. Then, but so whatever, whatever way you feel comfortable visualizing, it's easier to visualize this molecule as into the board and out of the board so that your epoxide can be either up or down that's fine. That's the way it's drawn here. If I was going to draw the same molecule, if I wanted to draw the molecule flat, it would look like this, right? So that's just taking that same molecule and flattening it out in which case the plus DET product would have the, the epoxide point, pointed above the structure here, and the minus would be behind the board. All right, so just two ways of visualizing the same thing, get us back thinking about these as 3D objects. Yeah, I thought it was easier to draw the structures the second way, because that first way I was trying to draw those like 3D structures, and it's like, Unless you have the shading to show that that's a plane coming out towards you, then yeah, it's it's kind of hard to visualize that that alkene group. Um, that yeah, the main thing is top right. Put the OH group in the top right, and then you can do pluses up, minuses down. So let's do some practice. So in the other the other reactants here with the DET and the titanium um, is just this um, peroxide, this T-butyl peroxide, which just serves as the source of the oxygen. So the other byproduct is you're going to get T-butyl alcohol out of this. Just like with the peroxy acid, we were able to add an, ox an oxygen one place and rearrange it, reshuffle it around to make the standard acid. We see the same thing here with the with the uh, T-butyl peroxide. Um, it's just a convenient size and molecule to use. Um, but technically, any peroxide could be used to do this reaction. Did everybody get a chance to try these? over the weekend. I'm actually gonna do, while you're doing this, I'm going to chop this figure up real quick and give myself room to draw on the slides, so.
All right, so A is already kind of set up for us with the oxygen in the right spots. We don't even really need to worry too much about rearranging A. So the product then, we're not changing any carbon structure, so just draw all the carbons where they were. Then because it's the plus DET, the epoxide is above the plane of the, the pi bond. So we're gonna get the enantiomer that looks like this, which if I'm getting specific about the stereochemistry, would look more like that. that carbon that has the OH on it now is into the board so that the epoxide is out of the board. And then B, we just have to do a quick rearrangement. You flip it over like a pancake. Get this molecule, right? Only thing that changes when we do that is, is we put the carbon with the OH up. Nothing else is, is attached to the ring structure, so nothing else moves really. So then our product is going to look like Doesn't like when I shade. So that's coming out towards us. It's not the prettiest wedge I've ever drawn. Our epoxide, because it's the minus, is going to be below the ring. All right, so it's all just in orienting molecule so that the oxygen's in the right spot and then it's then it's simple plus is up minus is down and again you don't you don't have to redraw it to get there if you can do this in your head and re reorient yourself in your head you don't have to do that you could say oh the hydroxides in the or the alcohols in the bottom right instead of the top right therefore everything is going to be flipped you could redraw it that way. To me, that's adding an unnecessary place for you to mess up, though. Um, I think we're all good enough at rearranging the, the molecule in our head that take the time to draw the structure out um, with the oxygen in the right spot rather than trying to do it all mentally. Just like when you first started learning how to do algebra in Gen Chem, um, you wanted to show all your algebra work. Not because the algebra was that interesting, but you don't want to try and be, do something in your head um, that's going to get your answer wrong. It's just an easy place to mess up. It's unnecessary when it can just be avoided by a little bit of extra work. These ones that are set up. Um, that are set up. Horizontally, we're just going to rotate them. We don't need to flip them. You just rotate. And in this case, we only wind up with one stereo center in each of these because both C and D have two identical substituents on the left hand carbon. Um, but we do get one stereo center each. So it's still worth showing the stereochemistry here. So for C, there's our same molecule rearranged and it's plus. So
there's our epoxide. And on D, you're going to get the same thing. And then you can go back and redraw the uh, methyl groups to show your that they're going into the board. Actually, through that one. Oh, and I missed that the second one is minus. So switch those. We're gonna have methyls coming up. Their oxygen going down for that second one. I didn't put this together on uh, Thursday, but the fact that we're doing the Sharpless epoxidation reaction now, the next chapter that we're going into after sulfurs and epoxides um, has the second reaction that Sharpless won a Nobel Prize for uh, involved, the, the click reaction, which is the cyclo addition. We're going to talk about the, the more classic cyclo addition first, which is called the Diels Alder reaction, but the other most important cyclo addition um, in in research is the is known as the Sharpless click reaction um, that he won a Nobel Prize for in 2023. So last year, last year or the year before, and that was a big deal because that was the reaction that I studied for my for my dissertation in grad school um, was studying that reaction. So I was thoroughly tickled by the fact that Sharpless won a no, another Nobel Prize. That's the reaction. It's an alkyne reacting with an azide. It looks like an azide is three carbons in, or three nitrogens in a row. It looks like this. It's a pretty unstable reaction. There's a couple different um, resonance structures. I think one of the resonance structures looks like that, and the other one has a triple bond at the end. Um, but when you let that react with an alkyne, you wind up making a structure where you break two pi bonds and make two new sigma bonds out of it. So you end up making this structure that is aromatic and therefore super, super stable. And it's a way to really, really reliably and irreversibly link two different molecules together. Um, so they actually use this a lot in biochemistry research because if you attach it, uh, an alkyne, a terminal alkyne to one protein and you can attach um, an azide to another protein, you can basically link them together and tether one protein to another protein. Um, which seems like, why would you want to do that? Well, if one of the proteins is green fluorescent protein, um, then it, you can actually track where the, uh, the first protein is moved within the cell by just shining light, UV light on it. You can see what parts glow green are where that, cert, that first protein is accumulating. Um, so there's like another like molecule attached to the rise and would that affect its behavior? It does a little bit. But base, if we can make that chain a little bit longer so it's flexible and um, the, the proteins in a cell wind up getting moved 
where they need to go and embed it in membranes pretty reliably, regardless of if there's some extra weight tagging along. Green fluorescent protein is a pretty small protein, too, as far as proteins go. Um, so, yes, it does affect it to some extent, but it's also shown to be pretty good at being able to tag certain um, macromolecules in cells to, to watch how they work, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. Um, but he, and you can also play around with changing up their structure by having them be physically linked together um, as well. There, because if you remember back to the electron transport chain, a bunch of those complexes that are embedded in the, the mitochondrial membranes were physically linked together so that they could do like a direct handoff from complex two to complex three, say. Um, they're two separate proteins, but they wind up sort of linking together. And so they can experiment with, well, what if we take these two proteins that aren't normally attached together? If we attach them together, is that going to increase their efficiency? Is that going to change how they behave in the cell um, in one way or another? It doesn't matter if it's increasing efficiency or decreasing efficiency. If we can control it, that's still a reliable lever that the biochemists and molecular biologists have to work with. Um, so this was, this was a big ticket reaction, especially back in the, in the early 2010s, late 2000s. Um, and everybody was using it and, it and it was because Sharpless was the one who figured it out and he was working with green fluorescent protein because he actually has, I don't know if he still has a day job at this point, um, but his you know permanent job was at Scripps um, Research Institute in San Diego, which does a lot of work with marine invertebrates and marine biochemistry um, because they're in San Diego. Um, so he was in green fluorescent protein was first isolated from jellyfish, maybe something deep, deep ocean um, was the first place the green fluorescent protein was was isolated. The last example, um, when I was drawing it, I drew like the carbon chain, like in a plane, and then with the oxide down and the alcohol and the other methyl group up, would that be wrong or is that? No, so basically, effectively, you took the OH, the way it's drawn here, if you took the oxygen and you put it straight back, that's going to rotate this down so it can be flat, right? right? And make this pop up. Yeah, okay. So that's the same molecule. Okay. Yeah, just make sure that was correct. It's in my head. It's, it's not a little bit pretty. Yeah, I, I tend to draw the epoxide off to the left in this case because that's where there's more room to draw. And out of habit, I always put the wedges and the dashes in the same direction because that's more, more accurate. If you drew the, especially if you drew the epoxide down into the right, then, then you would want to draw the, the um, substituents that are on the right hand side of the molecule. Draw them as popping up. That's what I did. Yeah, I'm just checking things. Yeah, what's more important, which one's up and which one's down, is the one that's up is pointed in the same general area as the one that's down. All right, so we have a way to make, to reliably make epoxides. Um, what do we do with epoxides? Why is this all that useful? Well, an epoxide, if we can make an epoxide reliably, it also allows us a way to, it's basically a way to make an addition reaction two steps and two very controllable steps. Because if you think back to doing addition reactions with alkenes, we had Markovnikov versus anti-Markovnikov, um, but we were still a little bit limited into how many reactions we had where we could control what went where and what the stereochemistry looked like. So epoxides are useful for that because you can set it up so um, by making that triangular ring structure, that makes it a really good target for any other nucleophile to come in and attach on the opposite side. Um, so it's basically because because remember all those three sided ring ring structures like the, the mercurinium ion and the bromonium ion. Those were all intermediates that then allowed us to say, okay, well, now I know what my next molecule is going to do and come in here. And epoxide is another way to do that with an oxygen instead of with a mercury ion or instead of bromine. So it's going to follow all of our same logic as those other ones. 
um, when we're figuring out what bond is going to be broken and what bond is not broken. When we do these ring opening reactions, they follow the same logic. You're going to break the bond on the side that's more substituted. Um, but so this basically just allows us to do things like reliably add a second oxygen. So we can have, we can make a diol really predictably um, by doing this instead of doing a hydration where it's hydrogen one side, OH the other, or a halo hydrin where it was bromine one side and oxygen on the other side, or two hydrogens. This is the way we can add two oxygens um, through a what it amounts to an addition reaction. All right, and so nothing we haven't seen before. In fact, whole, the whole SN2 followed by a proton transfer should start to feel like, you know, comforting at some level. Oh, it's just another one of these. There's nothing new about it. It's just new, new vocab, new functional groups that we're starting from. Um, and because it's an epoxy, we saw this with the ethers as well. Um, this happens even faster than an ether being, being replaced, even though technically it's, it's like a, you got a nucleophile attack and leaving group leaves at the same time on the first step, um, which is drawn as a quote unquote ring opening reaction, but a ring opening reaction is really leaving group leaves, right? It's just leaving group leaves from one of the carbons it's attached to, but not the other. So it's very similar to when we had ethers um, going through acidic cleavage, right? Um, the difference is just that um, because of that strain energy, it happens even faster. So, and again, this is one of the reasons why epoxies are so good as, as a glue or as making a, a resin or a polymer is because we're storing them. It's kind of like, you know, storing something with, um, with a lot of spring tension in it. Like if you, if you could picture, um, you know, loading up, I don't know, loading up a, a Nerf blaster and then, and cocking it and then putting it away and you're storing all that strain energy in it. Right. And then if you go and pull it out, it's really easy to release that all at once. And so storing something as an epoxy, as an epoxide, and then having a separate tube that's going to allow it to go through a ring opening reaction is a really effective way of, of making an irreversible, um, really strong bond between things. You're storing it. That's the spring in this case is the chemical strain energy, not physical mechanical spring energy. Um, and so we can do these ring opening reactions with pretty much any nucleophile we want. Um, here's some examples of common strong nucleophiles. You can use a deprotonated ether, and that's going to give you that ring opening reaction that will give you an OH on one carbon and an ether on the other carbon. Um, you can use, we haven't talked about cyano groups much. Um, also called nitrile groups, but remember that's just that molecule, that polyatomic ion, cyanide ion is just a carbon triple bonded to a nitrogen and the carbon has a negative charge. Hmm. Um, you can also do it with sulfur, Sulf a deprotonated sulfide or sulfur is a pretty good nucleophile as well. Again, this is this is really a uh, callback, right? Because these were all on our list of what's a good nucleophile, what's a weak nucleophile, but we haven't gone through that list in a while. So this will make you, if you do this, if you use that, that middle one, you're gonna make a product that's called a bioether. So it looks a lot like a regular ether, but the word bio means you took an oxygen and you replaced it with, with a sulfur. So a thioether is the same thing as an ether, just with a sulfur instead of an oxygen. 
And then last but not least, these two reactions that we've been spending a lot of time with. Um, you could make your strong nucleophile a Grignard reagent. And so now we have a pretty good, and that this is really common in uh, when we're talking about epoxides because they, the ring opening reactions are so easy because of all that strain energy. This is a really effective way to add an R group and to add a, a, a alcohol at the same time. All you needed to do was start with an alkene, right? You can take an alkene and you could take and have it go through a Grignard reagent. We've talked about that already a little bit, um, but it works better if you have them that epoxide or if it's starting from a carbonyl, right? Um, so starting making the epoxide and then following it with the Grignard reagent is basically a way to chop off a few steps. We could have gotten there without knowing this reaction. We could have gotten to, I needed to add an R group here and an OH group there by doing you know, a Markovnikov reaction or something or an anti-Markovnikov. Um, but this also allows us to put the R group one carbon away from the alcohol. So if you need to add a a methyl group on carbon two and an alcohol on carbon one, making an epoxide is a pretty good way to do that. And then last but not least, if you just want to take your epoxide and turn it into um, just an alcohol, you can use lithium aluminum hydride. And that one's a little bit overkill because we can get that same net result another way, right? Rather than go through Um, the, the process of the reactions here would be, you know, an alkene turned into an epoxide turned into turned into an OH group and a hydrogen, right? That's just a hydration reaction. So why would we do that when we could use oxymercuration or um, or hydroboration to reliably do it? Well, one, if you're trying to avoid using mercury, this is a workaround if you want to avoid using mercury. And two, there are there were some specific cases where we didn't get great yields with some of those other hydration mechanisms, right? So this is effectively just a hydration, but if there are other variables around, um, then you, this still might be a useful way to do this. You might be able to get better yields doing this way and control the stereochemistry if you use one of those Sharpless oxidations. Um, you could control what enantiomer you make going through this process, although that's kind of convoluted and really, really niche. Um, and I should also say that going back to the Sharpless reaction, Um, this is a very specific reaction. This is the one that's in the textbook, though. This is the first one that historically was most important because it proved that you could use a chiral catalyst to make a chiral product. Um, since then, they found lots of other variations of this that use the same idea. They're slightly different. Uh, this is the one that's taught in the textbook, though, just because it is the first one. Um, but there are, are other versions that are not quite so neat, niche or that are um, that you could go through and look through a list to find the one that fits your particular model that you're working on if you're doing research on this. Um, so it's not like you, you know, it seems like a very, very tiny thing to win a Nobel Prize for, but it opened the doors to a lot of other research because of that, the fact that it does continue on is more of a proof of concept than it was the end product in itself. All right, so let's do a practice on this one. I'll zoom in on it, see a little better. So try and keep the proper stereochemistry and pick which 
carbon is the is the cyano group going to attach to? All right, so which of these, the first step is going to be nucleophile attacks and leaving group leaves, right? And the ring opens. Which of these carbons is actually going to be the target? Why? Because, or, or wait, well, no, it's going to, or the OH will go to the list substituted because it, it can support that carbocation. Yeah, that we're not truly making, it's an SN2 process, so we're not truly making a carbocation, um, but that transition state is gonna look, is gonna have carbocation character. So we want that to be on the more substituted carbon. And really in this case, because it's a tertiary carbon on one side, um, normally we wouldn't see SN2 reactions happening with the tertiary carbon, right? But because the tertiary carbon, one of two of those um, things attached to it, it's not a true tetrahedral structure. Yeah, there are sterics, but because it's an epoxide, that kind of limits this the geometry because you have to make that triangular shape, right? Um, and so that strain energy makes it so that kind of keeps the other substituents out of the way a little bit and does allow you to have an SN2 reaction out of tertiary carbon still would probably be a little bit slower under normal circumstances, but because that transition state is going to be more stable, we can expect the red arrow to be the, the more common one here. And realistically, this is definitely a case where we will probably see a little bit, we'd see a mixture of the two um, products because of the sterics. So then we're going to get a molecule that looks like And then how many carbons? We have what? One, two, three, another three. One, two, three. So a molecule will look something like this. Everything on the right-hand side, nothing really changed position. And on the left-hand side, because it's an SN2 process, those ones that were into the board and out of the board facing downward, flipped upward to make room for our new our new uh, cyano group.
And then the second step is just that proton transfer. We have a deprotonated alcohol, we expose it to water, we're gonna protonate that alcohol. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back in. At five after, we'll start going through these problem practice problems. Um, and it's just more of the same. What's What are you adding and to which side? Figure out what your nucleophile is, figure out which side of your epoxide is going to break, and then pay attention to your stereochemistry. It was good. I got a 94. No way. That's yeah, good. Good job. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I, know I wasn't expecting much. <laughs> I was like, all right, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's kind of how I felt too. After I took it, I was like, <laughs> I <know. laughs> I was like, uh, oh, I don't think I should do it. Yeah. Well, I was taking it. I was like, oh, man, I should have broke shit down. <laughs> I yeah. wrote a lot down, but I like, forgot that bowling problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's what uh, David and Matt were talking about. They're like, there's so many torque. Like, I just didn't expect that. I totally just forgot. Like, you just had those two with the P and then you put them together. And then put them together. I know. <laughs> like, duh. I know. It's so frustrating, too, because it's like something we went over to first quarter. Yeah. It and it's like, wow. She's, I thought she like would have tested us on that. She's yeah. like, no, it's in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm never like awake during the lab. Just, just go through the measurements. <laughs> yeah. It's good, though. Yeah, it takes the pressure off the vinyl. Exactly. So, much of that. Yeah. I just want this corner to be over with. Uh, it's so close. Like, I was yeah. looking at, because um, in class, I was looking at a little bit of my anatomy and physiology schedule. Oh, right. And I'm like, oh my God, there's like literally like this week, next week, and finals. That's so crazy. Uh, yeah. And I got like two. Giant speeches to do, and I'm just like, oh, <laughs> oh, that's, uh, oh, that's terrible. I feel it. Just gotta go through the motion. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll pass. Yeah. <laughs>
wants to scale, but it's just conditions aren't favoring it anymore. Right. So we've been told we're go for moving oh, for spring good. quarter. Oh, cool. It's exciting. Yeah, very old. It's really exciting. Yeah. yeah. They're um they're doing giving the board a tour of the of the offices and the labs. So there's you know 20 construction workers finished trying to finish up, up yeah. all the <laughs> like last minute stuff today. Have you been able to see it yet? I just walked through it right now. Um not supposed to, but but um, no, they're doing the tour, and I think the tour is actually open to the public. Cool. Um, if you are around and feel like seeing the new space, at the very least, I am I was invited to go on the tour because some of the science faculty want to see the offices before we pick them. Uh, um, and uh, and I'm not going to go. Do you do offices? So, yeah, I get new offices. I won't be in the portable anymore. Do you get a private office? Or? I do. Um, yeah, they're they, they look like the ones um, upstairs. You've That's seen cool. the new offices upstairs for the faculty. Yeah. They're just like that, except that they're where they're behind the bio lab. So, and the bio lab is going to have an entrance on both sides now. So that'll be really nice. And if you remember where the IT offices were before. Um, is that's that's going to be all the science faculty offices. So I'll be a little bit further away from the chem lab, just down the hall, though. Yeah, that's still nice, though. Yeah. It'll be really nice. I've never had my own office. Right. Oh, we'll the office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Can you know, set up the record player and listen to music and not have to worry about as much about other people. So that'll be all right, so take a couple minutes, and if you haven't yet, and try and work through these. And then in a couple couple minutes, I'll start working through them. Never gonna like shut itself down while you're using it. I haven't seen that. Okay. I've only used it this quarter though. Yeah. Just a couple times a week. Well, this is the first quarter. Oh, right. Brandy. Um. Okay. Just checking. Yeah. No, it seems to be fine. Making the AB patch list. Do you ever use the audio? No, it seems to work though. I know Scott Valentine has been using it for for watching videos and stuff. I know. Um. And we. I guess I use it for recording. 
um, because I record all these lectures on Zoom. Um, and it seems to be capturing the audio all right, I would say, right? It doesn't sound like it's not this, it's not my local microphone. It sounds a little more echoey, right? I think the very last one is a little different, but it would like kind of fade more, but usually it captures a pretty good okay. audio. Okay, the, the microphone should be these two, the little round ones. Okay. Yeah, then maybe it was just that I was sitting here talking to my computer oh, since okay. nobody else was in the room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah usually you're like in the same. middle. <laughs> I just wasn't sure if it was which one it was. Um, by you were using this? I have before. Okay. I don't usually. Um, normally, I just do screen share and capture. Oh, okay. Capture that, but it's it's worked fine. The both the um the camera and the audio when I do use that that camera. When I checked out the audio uh, last week, it sounded like distorted, like. Mm -hmm. like the, like static, I guess you could say like interference or something's wrong with the amp. No, I'll, I'll so on the on the, the recording side, side, we haven't seen any of that, but I don't yeah. use the speakers. Yeah, you use the, the microphone. I think it's that microphone though, because this one it defaults when this is plugged in, it defaults to using that webcam, not this webcam. Okay. So it's probably using that microphone, but I like I said, I don't use the speakers though. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah. The instructor should use it the most and the longest like. Scott Valentine would be the one to ask. Yeah, yeah. He uses more videos than I yeah, do. He tells me. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks. How about what you're up to? Punch lists. Everybody's favorite thing. All right. And I'm I'm not off my base on that, right? We have on the on the recording side, the audio's been fine, right? Yeah. yeah. And I do think that last one is just because I was sitting right here talking right at the screen, not talking, projecting into the room. Yeah, it's, it's mostly good. It's just like kind of fade off a little bit here. Yeah. All right. And I, and it looks, I did go back and double check the stereochemistry for that last reaction. Just to double check, um, and for the epoxide for the ring opening, it does say that the major product will be the less hindered target. So I did. So this would have been the minor product would have gone this way. The major product would have gone to the less hindered. The um, nucleophile would attack the less hindered product. So the secondary carbon in this case, which is contradictory to some of the, the talk we've had about that carbocation character. Yeah. Um, but it seems like specific to epoxides, it's the, the secondary will be slightly favored in this case, more than, the, more than the tertiary in this case. And if it was primary versus secondary, like the ones on the next page, are this, yeah, primary versus secondary, we can expect that our nucleophile will attack the less substituted. So sorry for, sending you the wrong way on that one, but we do have some clarification. So for A, what's our nucleophile? There's a Right, so it's a Grignard reagent, so we're going to wind up with that benzene ring acting as our nucleophile, and it'll go to the less substituted and the oxygen keeps those. So we're going to wind up with got a methyl group there. After the second step, and we do the proton transfer, we're going to wind up with that, and then a benzene ring. Attached. So we're going to wind up with our final product here. We are going to have some stereochemistry involved. We'll worry about R versus S in a second, but just for the sake of of naming it, 
that's a three carbon chain is our longest continuous carbon chain that has the alcohol in it. Right, so we're going to say that that's going to be a one phenyl two or sorry. Uh, yeah, no, that works. Two propanol. It makes sense because it's isopropyl alcohol with the benzene added, right? So two propanol. It doesn't, it's just drawn not the way we would normally draw isopropyl alcohol because we're showing stereochemistry, because we have stereochemistry for that matter. Um, or if you wanted to, the way I was trying to write it would have been propan to all. If you wanted to put the two in the middle to make sure that you know that the two is unequivocally going with the alcohol part. And then as far as, yeah, let's let's number these. So there's our stereo center. One, two, three, is up, and then four is into the board, right? It's the hydrogen. So it looks like S, except yeah, it is S. I was going to say so we have to flip it, but no, four is already into the board. So stereochemically, S, one phenyl, two propanol. Can't, can't have us getting rusty on our nomenclature skills. We put so much time into it. <laughs> And the stereochemistry is going to be the same on the rest of these two, right? It's the same reaction four times. The only thing that's different is, is it a benzene ring or is it something else that's being added on the rest of these? So for B, it's a cyano group. So product is going to look like I'm not, so a lot of these have, I should probably specify, a lot of these um, functional groups have kind of more than one name, like it's a benzene ring or it's a phenyl group if it's a prefix. It's an alcohol or it's a hydroxy group. If you want to name an alcohol with a prefix instead of naming it as OL, you can, you can refer to that OH group. That's a hydroxide if it's by itself, right? So we can say there's a hydroxy group here. Um, so if you, I've slipped and done that a few times, like, oh, there's a, and I didn't explain it. Um, a, a hydroxy group, occasionally, some things that you normally name with a suffix, you need to name with a prefix. Like if you wanted to say it's, it's hydroxybenzene, um, because some other molecule already has a common name. Um, yeah, yes, you can go through a list of rules and do it a slightly different way, but in a lot of times when you want to, when you want to refer to just the functional group, you, you see it both ways. And I've been doing that with these, the cyanide nucleophiles as well. As a molecule, we'd call that a nitrile. Um, as a prefix, we call that a cyano group because it's a cyanide ion added. So just like hydroxy group. Um, if we're using it as a prefix. So if you hear me say a cyano group, that's what I'm talking about is one of these. And then nitrile just has to do with the nitrogen being triple bonded to more to a, carbons. Yeah, to a carbon. Um, that make that functional group is a nitrile or a cyano group. It's just too, it's like using passive voice when you're writing versus normal voice. Like you can write the same thing by switching the subject. It, you can kind of do the same thing, switch it from being a nitrile to a cyano. It means the same thing. You're just kind of changing the, the subject of the sentence, so to speak. Is the nitro, is that like the parent molecule? In this case, I believe so. I actually would have to refresh my memory on naming nitriles so we don't name them all that often. Um, 
but I believe that, yeah, the nitrile would have the higher priority. So this would be a hydroxy nitrile would be the, the uh, parent molecule. Um, but again, don't hold me to that. We'll talk about nitriles when we get into acid derivatives, because that's technically an a acid derivative because the oxidation state on that carbon is a plus three. Um, or C, we're at, we're turning into a thioether, right? A group we're adding. A sulfur attached to a methyl, or if there was something else um, you know, if it was an ethyl group or a propyl group or whatever, the important thing is just that we're adding a sulfur as a as an ether. And then last but not least, if you take this big complicated molecule and you just add lithium aluminum hydride and reduce it, we're just going to get two propanol. So you get just straight straight up isopropyl alcohol if we just reduce it with a hydride. Um, and these reactions, these ring opening reactions can happen under acidic or basic conditions. A lot of times, if we want to use a weaker nucleophile, it has to be under acidic conditions because that even further strains that ring energy. It makes it even better leaving group. And epoxide is already really good at breaking apart because it's got all that strain energy. If you add a hydrogen to it, so it's already protonated, that's an even better leaving group. And so that, that allows you to use really weak nucleophiles. So basic conditions favor using a strong nucleophile which makes sense because all of our best nucleophiles are bases. Uh, if you want to use a weaker nucleophile, you just do it under acidic conditions and the order of the steps flips. You do the proton, the proton transfer followed by the ring opening step instead of the other way around. And so that one really is the same as an acidic cleavage, like, like identical, right? It also kind of hints that you could have, um, under basic conditions, you could have an ether cleavage as well, depending on what your nucleophiles are, right? Since this effectively is an acid, an ether cleavage. Let's double check. I don't think it's a dioxy group because there is no oxygen anymore. So it would not be a methoxy or even a thiomethoxy. I think it's going to be a Methyl sulfide might be the way. I think we name it as a sulfide, but let me double check that. In fact, actually, I think I have that. So it's a sulfide. So we would just name that as the, instead of saying ether, so the common name for that would be um, we'd call that a methyl sulfide group. Um, 
there's a better answer for that though. I'm just trying to. Nomenclature sulfides is similar to that of ethers. Work on these systematically. Alkyl bio group. So you would say that's a methyl bio instead of saying a methoxy. It's still going to be two propanol as the parent molecule. And then it's going to be one methyl bio instead of methoxy. It's always close. It's not a thio methoxy group, it's a methyl bio group. But that base, that bio, there are two two um, you know, roots that all, that always mean sulfur. Bio means you took you took an oxygen and replaced it with a sulfur. The other way you name a so a thiol. Actually, what I'm doing that there's a um, if we if we have a thiol is replacing it an oxygen with a sulfur in an alcohol. So hence the OL at the end. Um, um, that always means sulfurs involved. So anytime you see something mercaptan, mercapto, I don't know where, I, I guess I do know where it comes from. Um, sulfurs and mercuries form almost, almost irreversible um, ionic bonds as a precipitate. Mercury sulfides dissolve in like almost nothing. It's really, really hard to get mercury sulfides um, to dissolve in anything. Um, and so they referred to them originally as mercapto because it was like the sulfides captured the mercury. So that's why it doesn't have any, thio means sulfur. That's what the root means in Latin and, and in Greek. But mercapto is because of a result of the fact that it behaved in a specific way with mercury, which is kind of interesting. Um, I had, I don't think any of you were here, remember Chris Fabry or Matt Mims? Um, they were two of our, two of our um, chem students. Matt Mims still lives around town somewhere. Um, they, uh, their research project in Gen Chem in the third quarter of Gen Chem um, was taking cinnabar, which is mercury to sulfide, and um, reducing the mercury to make metallic mercury from cinnabar, which is a mineral. Um, so they want, because they were both interested in the geology side, um, but also like the idea of taking an ore and refining it to make a metal is kind of cool. And so they, so they actually got some cinnabar samples from Scott Val Valentine. They thought they had some cinnabar that they found on a hike. It turns out that they, um, it was not actually cinnabar when they tried to, to get Scott to confirm it. But Scott gave them some samples of cinnabar. Um, and then to get it to dissolve for the reaction to happen, we had to use aqua regia, which is Latin for water of kings or the king water. It's the closest thing we have to a universal solvent. It'll dissolve almost anything. It's like three parts concentrated sulfuric acid to one part concentrated nitric acid. It's like take two of the strongest concentrated acids and you mix them together. Um, and then you're able to get mercury sulfide to dissolve into its ions. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, it was kind of, it was a fun project because they were able to actually produce liquid mercury from this, this geological sample, um, which is awesome. It was a fun project. How long did it take? It took them a couple weeks of like one lab period a week, like one, the first week we dissolved this, got the cinnabar to, to dissolve and we let it continue dissolving because it was in these big chunks. We crushed it up best we could, but it's still a rock. Um, and so then we let it dissolve for a week. And then the following week, 
we started the reduction process and then we refined it, we cleaned it up the third week to remove the sulfur because you also wind up producing um, elemental sulfur, like yellow brimstone, um, which is then need to remove that from the mercury. Um, but, uh, it, and then I think we did it a few more times to try and nail down the procedure. Just say you, you all have found in, in OCHEM labs, the first time you do a procedure, it's not always the right way, even if you do have a, you know, a checklist in front of you. But I still have a sample of that mercury. It's in my, I keep, when I have good Gen Chem projects, when they make a good product at the end, a lot of times they don't know what to do with it. And so they just like, here, have, have this. And so I have a little vial of liquid mercury and sitting with my student samples that was from that, that experiment. Um, so that's, so a mercaptan is the, is the name of that class of molecule. It's a little bulky here. There we go. Um, and so, and this is a comp, a um, concept that we talk about a little bit in Gen Chem. Do you remember talking about making those complex ions? and how you could have those ligands that attached to those metal ions in solution. And they kind of would like surround them in like an octahedral shape. Um, just, and one of the ways that we, and actually we talked about it in this class, we talked about chelates not that long ago, huh? I don't remember what we were talking about last Tuesday, but we brought up EDTA and chelation therapy for heavy metal poisoning with the crown ethers, yeah. Um, so before they understood or they knew about EDTA, um, it had been observed that the dimercaprol, this molecule here, was pretty good at treating heavy metal poisoning because it forms those really, really strong complexes with mercuries and leads, which were the most common heavy metals to be poisoned by historically. Um, I mean, not not fully equally, but it will treat both of them. Anything that's that relatively that size and has a positive charge is going to form a pretty strong bond with these sulfur electrons. Um, and you can basically just sort of wrap it up with all that electron density, and that doesn't give it a chance to interact with, with all the enzymes around. Um, that said, dimercaprol is not particularly healthy to have in your body long-term anyway, but as a short-term, you don't want to use the word cleanse, but that's effectively the medical process of doing a cleanse is flush everything out. With something that's going to carry it out better, bond to it better than what's normally in your system. So a short exposure to something that's not great for you can wind up flushing out everything else that's, that's not everything else, all of the heavy metals um, that might have started to accumulate in your body. I, you, you joke, but that's the, you can actually just go get a chelation therapy. So there's a place in, in Reno that does chelation therapy. Um, they probably do a lot of like red light therapy, all sorts of other pseudoscientific stuff. But this chelation therapy um, is actually a real medical treatment that works. It's just overused, just like a lot of medical treatments that, um, that you see pop up in pop culture. It doesn't work really bad. Well, in, historically, before even we knew about uh, about mercaptans, um, chelation therapy was still used. They didn't understand why it worked, but drinking milk helped with heavy metal poisoning because a lot of the proteins and compounds in milk could do the same thing that EDTA or di dimercaprol can do. Um, and that's also, that's still to this day why if you're, if you're cooking with, with offal, with, you know, butcher cuts, you know, especially things like sweetbreads, glands and things like that where heavy metals tend to accumulate. Um, 
you soak it in milk first before you cook with it and it gets rid of a lot of nasty taste and that's literally because it's pulling heavy metals and other large ions that bioaccumulate in those organs um, into the milk um, so it's basically doing a quick chelation therapy um, before you cook with it and the result is it tastes better that's that's literally why you're just pulling out some of those toxins literally like their liver and the yeah it, it works better if you if you you know either tenderize it do something to increase your surface area first otherwise you got to let it sit longer yeah. Um, but yeah that's you can, you literally just take these organs throw it in with some milk and wait for a little bit let it soak like it's marinade um and you you wind up with it tasting a lot better um i I don't have a problem with organ meat, but I also don't go out of my way to find organ meat. So I don't know that I've, I've done a side-by-side -side taste test of like, so you see this the most with sweetbreads, which are thyroids. Um, thyroids, I guess in brain too. Brain, brain tissue gets this treatment as well, but um, specifically with thyroids, because stuff tends to accumulate there and there's not really, your body doesn't have a method for flushing stuff out of your thyroids very effectively. So when it gets there, it kind of stays there. And so with animal plants like that, um, it's supposedly that's that's where it makes the most difference. Liver in general always is going to have all sorts of gunk because it's literally the body's filtration system, right? And so stuff also accumulates in liver as well. All right, if we want to make a thiol, remember Captain? Um, oh, I'm on the wrong, there we go. The easiest way is just do an SN2 process. Thiols um, are pretty good nucleophiles. So if you have an alkyl halide, just do an SN2 reaction or an SN1 reaction with a, um, with the sulfide and you'll wind up making a thiol. So nothing we haven't seen before, we just now have a name for it and some nomenclature for what the product we're making. We've seen this before though, right? As such, I don't know that we really need to spend a ton of time on this slide because it's literally just SN2 reaction. We've done this for for six months now, practically. The only thing to watch out for is just like always with SN2, if you want a specific stereoisomer, you need to start with the opposite stereoisomer because you're going to go through that, that umbrella flip. Uh, and here's here is the um, the chemical way of doing something that the body does that eukaryotic cells do. Actually, even prokaryotic cells um, have this process that is uh, pretty important to protein folding. There is one amino acid that has a is it cysteine, I think, that has a sulfur that is a thiol. Um, and that where thiols differ from alcohols is that they can make, if we tried to do this with an alcohol, um, we couldn't form an oxygen-oxygen single bond. That's a peroxide. We know that's really dangerous and really nasty and reactive, right? But sulfurs, because they don't, they're not as electronegative, um, they don't tend to split homolytically in the same way that peroxide bonds do. Um, and so when you want, have a protein that winds up folding in a way where you wind up with two cysteines, two um, thiol groups right next to each other, under physiological conditions, they will naturally form this disulfide bond, which, again, is like the sulfur equivalent of a peroxide bond, except more stable. Um, in the lab, we, use, we have to do it under basic conditions and expose it to bromine. The exposure to bromine basically is a mild, um, bromine wants to be reduced, so it's a mild oxidizing agent. 
And that mild oxidizing agent allows you to pull those hydrogens off of the, the thiols to make the disulfide bond. And so that this is really important in, in biochemistry because it's a way to link multiple, or it's a way to link polypeptide chains together, or basically it's like adding a safety pin, like making a fold in a protein and then sort of like putting a carabiner on it to hold those two pieces together. It's not totally irreversible. You can undo it. There are actually some really interesting biochemistry um, experiments where they proved how tertiary how protein folding is really important and that disulfide bonds are important is they basically they undid this process to a functional protein. So they unclipped the safety pins and let it rearrange itself and then tried to see if it was still just as good at, at catalyzing the same reaction as normal. And they found out that it lost almost all catalytic activity. Um, so these disulfide bonds wind up being really important for keeping proteins folded properly. Um, and then they put it back into conditions to let the disulfide bonds form again. And it got like 50% of its catalytic activity back. But if you happened to get the wrong cysteines next to each other, you could wind up putting in a closed pin in the wrong spot. And then you're basically locking it into being folded wrong. So it's sort of a, um, it was not a perfect refolding. It actually was one of the studies that showed that eukaryotic cells have mechanisms in place to aid to assist in proteins forming and folding properly. Um, is because if you remove all those other proteins and RNA molecules from the system, they don't fold properly on their own. Sometimes some enzymes will naturally in the absence of anything else will always fold the right way. Um, but some of the more complicated eukaryotic proteins in particular need extra help, extra machinery to get them to fold in a particular way. Right. Um, you know, it's a little bit like the difference between building a pyramid. You can get a pyramid to form naturally, like think about like a stalactite or stalagmite forming. It's kind of a big pyramid shape, right? But if you want to take something and get it to form a very, you know, a very specific type of four-sided pyramid, you have to put in some extra help to get it to build that proper way, right? Um, so assisting those natural processes using smaller proteins is really common in the quote more more evolved cells more complicated cells specifically eukaryotic ones um just a few other notes here um sulfides can also be oxidized um, in other ways um, in particular, because sulfur is the third row of the periodic table, now we have a D block to work with, right? We're not limited by the octet rule. And so you can make these other um, more complicated looking sulfur based molecules. So a sulfide is really similar to an ether. Um, there is no oxygen equivalent to a sulfoxide because you can't have an oxygen with more than eight electrons. And same for a sulfone. Sulfoxides and sulfones are specific to sulfurs um, and have some of their own characteristics that are not, um, that are kind of unique to, to sulfurs. Um, we don't see a whole lot of those in, in biochemistry. Sulfoxides and sulfones don't tend to show up in biochemistry as much because really the only place the body or the eukaryotic cells use sulfides um, or thiols is in those amino acid chains. And they typically, all they're going to do is make a disulfide bond, if anything. Um, the only, does anybody know the does anybody have their amino acids memorized? Nobody knows their, their side chains yet. Um, yeah, I don't have them memorized either. I know the most common ones, but the other one that has sulfur in it is methionine, thio, right? Um, and that's a, it's a methyl thio ether um, that where the R group is sulfur attached to a methyl. And so you wind up, that also winds up being important because that's also the start codon. That's every protein starts with 
um, with a methionine. Um, but that's chemically where the name comes from is it's a methyl group attached to a, a sulfur, it's methyl. Um, I tend to remember all the weird ones. His, histidine and proline. Histidine's the aromatic one. Proline's the one where the R group is attached to the amine group. Be more interesting after this class because at first you're just like, okay, arbitrary, right? You know, groups of, of well, and this is one of the reasons why OCHEM is is across the board in chemistry. You have to take OCHEM before you can take any upper division chemistry because. It's we're dealing mostly with the second row, so it keeps things simple, but it deals with a lot of the same concepts that biochemistry, that physical chemistry, um, are and inorganic chemistry for that matter are built on. You wouldn't want to jump straight to inorganic chemistry because then you're talking about hybridization involving d orbitals and much more complicated um, shapes and mechanisms right off the bat, as opposed to starting with the easy ones with OCHEM. Um, the other, the other two reactions we can see with, that involve sulfur are, and this is just the mechanism for making that disulfide, uh, it happens under basic conditions if we're doing it in a lab, um, specifically because the first thing we do is we deprotonate the thiol, and then you wind up with the thiolate, which can then act as a nucleophile. So thiols are much better acids than oxygens are. So you can do that pretty reliably to make that thiolate ion. And then it goes through this double SN2 process where this is where the bromine is important. This is less important in the body in biochemistry um, because you, if you wind up with that, that deprotonated sulfur in their physiological conditions, if it's next to another cysteine, then just purely by proximity, it'll eventually react with the other cysteine. Um, and so you don't really need some of these other harsher chemicals if you have proximity and you have built in proximity if it's a protein because they're covalently attached together. Even if they're 10 amino acids apart, 100 amino acids apart, they're being held next to each other if it's folding up in a certain way. Um, so like the, they can do neutral conditions. They can be in neutral conditions and you can just rely on the fact that over time, um, and it's not truly neutral, right? Physiological conditions are actually a little bit above a pH of seven, 7.4 to 7.8, depending on where in the body you are. Um, so very slightly basic conditions, but that's enough to deprotonate a measurable amount of the, of the thiols. And then if you have the thiol deprotonated next to a, a regular thiol, that's enough for this second SN2 step to happen, where that deprotonated thiol can just come in and attach to the protonated thiol. Um, it's a slower process if we don't have this and if it's under physiological conditions, but at equilibrium, it will happen on its own as long as those sulfurs are being held next to each other. By the rest of the molecule. Um, it's because the thiols are better acids than water, and water is always present, right? Even if you're in the middle of this other molecule, there's water molecules kind of around. There's other things that can act as a as a um, base, and so that just kind of over time, because this first step, if you just have a tiny amount of hydroxide around it still favors making the thiolate at equilibrium, right? If you give it enough time. And then if you have a thiolate next to a regular protonated thiol, then effectively you can cut out the middle of this bottom step and you wind up oh, with eventually, oh, the two sulfurs find each other and kick off a hydrogen. It might just take a little bit longer if we're not prepping the sulfur by, by making that thiol that bromine sulfur bond, thiobromo bond. All right, so last, last slide is just some more practice, more review. Um, and it's 
multiple reactions. So remember your ring opening reactions, remember your nucleophiles. But we only have five minutes left, so we're not gonna I'm not gonna do these right now. Um and it's only Tuesday. I was thinking I needed to save these for the quiz questions later, but we can so we can do these during um during lab. We can work through these when you have some downtime because I think we and let's make sure we get through this lab this week because I know we. Um, <laughs> Robert talked about I think, this yesterday. <laughs> I was thinking about it too when I was looking at the schedule and like, man, this doesn't usually take three full weeks. But I think it's because I let I let them divide and conquer last time I do this, yeah. and then come and then so we'll do that this time. Um, you know, I think there's probably what two or three parts left. If everybody takes one, including a melting point, um, oh, then we can get make sure we get through this and get all the data needed. And then um, this is week 10 of the quarter. I know. So um, so the other thing we'll do is is next week. So the, the lab final for this class is um, as a synthesis project. I say project, but it's basically I'm going to have you propose a synthesis. I'm going to give each of you a different synthesis problem. And then in addition to figuring out what the steps are to do that using the, the reactions that we've learned in class, um, the lab portion of it will be write it up like a procedure, like you're going to actually try this in lab. So including, you know, how many grams, how long, are you using solvent? So all the practical applications. And so you'll have two weeks to work on that. That'll be next week. I'll do the assignment next week and you can start planning stuff out in lab next week. Then you'll have all the way to the end of finals week to finalize that um, proposal. Is the lab like open basically during finals week or? We don't officially meet, but anytime, anytime Mariola is working, which is like, you know, 8.30 to, 8.30 to 4 most days, or me or Carlo, Carl are around, we can open it up. You don't need to actually go into the lab like, to do that, because we're not actually going to have you do the procedure. I'm just going to have you write the procedure. Okay, that's what that, I wanted, yeah. That's why we, so we don't actually, normal, like ideally, if we were at a bigger school, had more time, yeah. probably the third quarter, you would actually do that, but we're not going to order specialized chemicals that have short shelf lives for these that are, can, you know, so with that respect, we're just going to pretend, <laughs> um, write it up as though we were going to do that, but I'll be able, I'll get those. I'm going to finalize what everybody's synthesis is, um, and treat it kind of like the take home, like a take home test. Um, and then just write the, write out a procedure for it and do, do the best you can using the procedures that we've done in the past. Yeah. All right, let me stop recording and